Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Thoughtful Tuesday. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God and Father, we give you our heartfelt thanks for all your mercies and for all your blessings. And in this week, as we prepare for the beginning of Lent, we pray for your help that will help us to focus on Jesus, on his ministry, on his message, on his sacrifice upon the cross and upon his glorious resurrection from the grave. We pray that you will help us to keep our hearts and minds on his journey to the cross and for all that it meant to him and all that it has meant to millions of us ever since. Guide us and direct us by your Holy Spirit. And now, Father, we pray that you will help us as we turn to your word this morning for these brief few moments. Give to us the promised teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, for we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing our look at some of the miracles of Jesus, and I want to read to you the opening verses of Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles handy, you can turn with me, because we're going to see two miracles back to back. Luke chapter 7 begins like this. When Jesus had concluded saying all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. A centurion's servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this, because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Jesus went with them, and when they were not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, since I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning from the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. When those who had been sent to return to the house, they found the servant in good health. Afterward, he was on his way to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd were traveling with him. Just as he neared the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son. She was a widow. A large crowd from the city were also with her, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Don't weep. Then he came up and touched the open coffin, and the pallbearer stopped. And he said, Young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Then fear came over everyone, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. And God has visited his people. This report about him went throughout all of Judea and all the vicinity. Here we have two miracles back to back and they have interesting contrasts. Most of Jesus' uh, miracles, certainly the miracles of healing, are requested miracles. Someone comes seeking Jesus' help. Someone comes asking Jesus to come to the house to heal someone, to lay hands on him. Whether it's a leper asking to be made clean, whether it's Jairus begging for his daughter's life to be given back to her, whatever. And this is one of these requested miracles. The second one we're going to look at is a spontaneous miracle. Now, the Roman centurion was obviously a sensitive and kindly man. He was well spoken of by the Jewish leaders in the area, and he had helped them build 
a, uh, a synagogue for themselves. So he was generous, hardworking, and helpful, and well thought of. He probably thought that it would be impossible for a strict Jew to come into his house, for that would make the Jew unclean, ceremonially unclean at least. And so he sends someone to make the request. Perhaps Jesus could heal my servant, who obviously is very dear and very important to him. Now, this man had none of the advantages of being a Jew. He knew nothing about Jewish history. He knew precious little about the culture and the customs of the Jews. But he had heard about Jesus and he had faith in Jesus's ability. Great things were being said all over the region about this new prophet Jesus who had arisen and how he had miraculous powers and was able to do great things. Now, he's a man whose faith is astonishing to Jesus. And it's the only occasion where Jesus remarks on how great a faith this person has and how he has had more faith. He has more faith in Jesus than anyone he's encountered in the Jewish life and in Jewish society. The second thing that the second miracle proves, firstly, we see Jesus with his power over distance. He's able to heal, not even reaching the house, but saying the word and the servant gets well. They go home back to the house and they find, sure enough, he has become well. So Jesus in the first miracle displays his power over distance. In the second one, he displays his power over death. He comes to the village of Nain. And as Jesus is entering that village, there is a very sad procession, a funeral procession, going out to the burial ground outside the city. And there they are carrying the only son of a widow. Now, when it says an open casket, it just means that the body is wrapped in perfumed linen and is carried on what we would think of as a stretcher to reach the burial ground. And then his body will be put into the grave or into a tomb carved out of the rock. Jesus performs this miracle not because of a request, but because of his compassion. And nobody understood better than Jesus what a terrible situation a widow faced in those times. You depended upon the charity of others. You depended upon the kindness and generosity of friends. And if you were lucky to have any family left, you had to depend on them for your very existence. You had no way of earning a living and things were very tough for a widow. Now, Jesus has this wonderful compassion at heart when he sees this poor widow about to bury her only son and wondering what terrible things are going to happen to her in the future. How is she going to manage? Where is she going to get food? Where is she going to live? She finds herself in a desperate situation. Jesus performs this miracle out of compassion, not out of request. And it's a wonderful illustration of Jesus' spontaneous compassion. We see him the same idea when he reaches out and touches lepers who come and beg him for help in what in their society was viewed as a helpless illness, a low, slow death where they would die bit by bit, piece by piece. As we think of these miracles, let's remember Jesus on his journey to the cross. Jesus through his ministry, Jesus reaching out with care and compassion to the people he meets in every town and every village who need his help. And let us focus our minds on Christ as we go through these weeks of Lent. And may those thoughts and those passages that we will look at together be a blessing to our hearts and minds. And may God add his blessing.